So this video is going to be the continuation of a message that was delivered on Sunday the 20th of October, the title of which was Crucified. And if uh, you were there at the service on that day, you'll recall that I was unable to get through the remainder of my points. Uh, and so what I said was, perhaps rather foolishly, that I would record the remainder of the message. Now, this is something I've not done before, uh, so it may not be entirely polished, but that doesn't really matter all that much. Uh, I'm also standing in the main hall of the church here, and there is nobody to speak to. So I may or may not look at the camera, but I'm aware that this will be getting watched on our YouTube channel. So the last time what we looked at was the idea of sin and its seriousness. Now, in part one of this message, which you'll be able to go back and see if you would like, um, I outlined six reasons to answer the question why it was necessary for Jesus Christ to be crucified for you and for me. And I'll just take you through what those were again. And the last uh, time we looked at this subject, we really only got through point number one. And what I'm going to try and do in this video is take us through the remainder. Uh, and I'm not going to embellish what was previously intended. I'm going to deliver this exactly as I intended it for the day. And so the, the six points were this. Uh, why did Jesus have to go to the cross? Well, firstly, it happened because of the reality of sin in the world. And that's what we looked at last week. Secondly, it happened because God is holy and must punish sin. And I think we touched on that briefly. Holy meaning that God is set apart. He's entirely unique, utterly distinct, absolutely righteous and perfect, unlike you and I. Number three was it happened because of God's requirement that the removal of sin occurs by the shedding of blood that leads to death. Number four, it happened because it was pleasing to God. And we considered how that's quite a strange concept that the death of Jesus on the cross might have been pleasing to God. But we'll expand on that slightly in this video. Number five, it happened because it was planned from before the world was created. And I have a couple of scriptures that just point this fact out. And number six, it happened because God determined that in this way, he would be most glorified. For some reason, God determined that through all possible mechanisms by which he might be glorified most, that it was through the death of his son upon the cross. Now, if I remember correctly, uh, we finished up last time with a couple of analogies, and uh, I'm not going to do those again, um, but they gave us an idea of why it is the case that sin is so serious, and we thought about the holiness of God, and that really is at the core of why sin is so serious, because God is holy, and sin is something which is in total contrast to his nature. And uh, one of the other things that we touched on was the book of Hebrews in chapter 10. And I'll mention that again in this section of, of the message. But just to begin, um, whenever we're thinking about the fact that God is holy and we are not, Hebrews chapter 10 verse 31 tells us that it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And one of the reasons for this uh, takes us on to point two. And that is that it happened, the cross happened because God is holy. And we thought about what that means. Now, in the same way that you and I would not tolerate it if someone committed a serious offense against us or against someone that we love or even against someone that we don't know, if a genuine wrong has been done, we ourselves would demand justice and rightly so. And so it is with God. He cannot allow sin to go on without justice being done. It's not in his nature to let that happen. And one of the reasons that he can't allow that is because if he did, then he himself would no longer be holy because his perfect standard of absolute righteousness would no longer be upheld. And in some sense, you could say that as such, he would no longer be godly. And of course, it's just ridiculous to suggest that God can not be that which he is at his most central and in his essence, and that is godly. Okay, so sin has to be punished. 
And uh, I think we really clearly outlined that last time. Now, unfortunately, because time flew away, we never really got to words like love. We never got to words like grace. We never got to words like mercy, forgiveness, compassion, all of these attributes which just flood out of the character of God because ultimately God is love. That's not to say that love in this world should be upheld as something that's just like so amazing because God is love and therefore love is everything. No, what I mean by that is God in himself is the absolute definition of love and grace and mercy and forgiveness. And so, uh, although we're thinking about his holiness, which in some sense reveals the side of his character, which must sort of deal with sin so harshly and seriously, actually, there's a lot of things about the character of God, some of which we've just mentioned, that we never got round to last week. Uh, and that, or I say last week, a couple of weeks ago it was. And, uh, and that's unfortunate, but I'll touch on that a bit in this video. Now, one of the things that I love about this message, the message of the gospel, is that, to me anyway, it makes so much sense. Put like this, I think it, it does just uh, seem so simple. God is perfect, we are not. His perfection is infinite, it's unlimited. He is immortal. He's immeasurably beyond all the Bible says that we can ever ask uh, or, or, or think. Uh, and you know, he's beyond our reach since we are the opposite of God in this regard. We are limited, we are finite, we are, we are mortal, uh, and he is none of these things. And so when we think about the fact that we are so limited and God is so unlimited, why would it ever be the case that we could bring something to God which would be enough to satisfy his standard of perfection. I think you could add up all of the good, and we thought about this the last time, that although we perceive people's goodness to be good in the sense that God is good, that is not the case. But if people were truly good, and if we could add up all the goodness that's ever been done by any, everyone who's ever lived then I think that even all of that cumulatively would not be enough to reach God's standard because his standard is not just a measure of goodness. His, his standard is absolute goodness. Absolute goodness, something that you and I can not attain. Now, I don't mean that um, all of the bad things that people have done uh, outweigh the good and therefore the good is not good enough because all the bad things kind of overshadow. What I mean is that all of the good is just not good enough, even if it was uh, absolutely, you know, good in the sense that, that God is good. It would still not be enough because we ourselves are limited in our capacity uh, and God is not and his standard is unlimited goodness which cannot be measured, and he himself is the definition of that. Um, now, the message of the cross is that God's standard of goodness was met by Christ, because as he lived in the flesh, as God, he shared the same nature of God, a nature which, as we've thought, is infinite, unlimited, and immortal. He, Jesus Christ, lived a perfectly sinless life, keeping all of God's commandments because he is the definition of God's commandments. He himself is the command of God. He's the word of God made flesh. So whatever he is offering God is truly acceptable because it has the capacity to be absolutely good, just as God is absolutely good. And it meets the criteria which God has set, that the standard which much must be reached is absolute perfection. And because Jesus' nature is divine, is perfect, he reaches that standard. That's why it's so essential to Christianity that Jesus is truly God in human form, that he's nothing less than that. Because if he is anything less than absolutely divine, then his sacrifice upon the cross, his offering to God through his life of almost absolute perfection, but not quite, would be absolutely worthless 
for you and I because God's standard is absolute and Jesus must meet it. And he does because his nature is divine. And we have evidence of this in the scriptures. Proof that Jesus is the divine son of God seen in how he lived and how he died. Okay, so moving on from uh, this point, we get to point number three, and that is that it happened because God's requirement for the removal of sin is the shedding of blood, which leads to death. Now, if you're unfamiliar with this idea, then it can seem very strange indeed, but I like to just explain it in as short a way as I can. So to explain this point, we need to go back to the Old Testament and take a look at some scriptures. So simply, I'll just pick out a couple. Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11. This is what it says. It says, for the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood, which contains the life, that makes atonement by the life by the life being given, by that life coming to an end and the blood in which that life is held being shed. There's no option. that The life will end when all the blood is shed. And as a consequence, God is able to substitute life for life. And so historically in the Old Testament, this was the life of an animal for the life of a person. And that atonement was able to cover sin for a season. For those of you who know Jim, uh, Jim McClatchy often makes the point that within this word atonement, we see at one meant. That atonement is that thing which makes us one with God. So it's the giving of one life in exchange for another that makes the covering as it was in the Old Testament or now with the sacrifice of Christ the removal of sin possible. God has made it so that, as Hebrews chapter 9 verse 22 says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. This is God's requirement, whether we like it or not, this is just the way it is. And I think it makes sense that life for life should bring something about. Uh, but of course, life for life with regards to the shedding of the blood of an animal clearly has limitations but the life of Christ as unlimited as it was because his divine nature is unlimited is such that it can remove and forgive sin entirely. Now, the very first hint that we get right at the start of the Bible that blood is necessary for sin to be removed is something that happened with the first two people that God made, Adam and Eve. And we know from the account that we have in Genesis that Adam and Eve were created and they were placed in a perfect world without sin. They lived sinlessly and in continual relationship with God until the choice was made to disobey God's commands, to rebel against him because they desired, as they were deceived, to become like God, knowing good and evil. And God said to Adam and Eve, he said, you can have anything you want from this garden in which I've placed you, except for one thing, that tree in the middle over there, don't eat of it or else you will die. What did the serpent say? You'll not die. You'll become as God. And in some sense, he was right. They didn't die. They didn't die immediately, but they brought upon themselves a death which was inescapable, spiritual death, instantaneous spiritual death, separation from God, which ultimately saw them flung out of that garden. But what I want to just focus on right now is that uh, we are getting pointed to the necessity of the shedding of blood. And that is that something had to be done in order to make a way for Adam and Eve to come back to God. Now, the story continues after they rebel against God by eating the fruit. Seems so simple, but the fact of the matter is that God told them not to, and their disobedience was the thing that brought the sin. Now, this first hint that something has gone terribly wrong for them is that they look at each other and something is different now. 
standing there in all of their natural beauty, shall we say, they start to feel a sense of shame at their nakedness. This is new. They haven't felt this way before. Up until this point, everything has been innocent. Everything has been entirely natural, sinless, no shame, nothing to judge each other for or doubt each other for. They haven't felt this way. And so in the midst of this shamefulness, they scurry off to make coverings for themselves. Now, I don't know what the seasonal rotation of the Garden of Eden was like, whether there was an autumn or not, like it is outside right now at this time of the year. I doubt it in some way, because of course that cycle clearly demonstrates death as a tree sheds its leaves and sort of dies in some way before the spring comes and then newness of life is seen. But anyway, uh, that speculation aside, the fact is this, that they became aware of their nakedness and they decided to do something about it. And the scriptures tell us that they sowed fig leaves together to make themselves a covering. Now, I googled fig leaves whenever I was uh, looking at this story. And uh, the first statement that I noticed uh, on Google whenever I punched in fig leaves was this one. Fig leaves are highly perishable. It's not exactly the best choice of garment for someone that's looking to keep themselves covered, is it? Now, for, for those of you who, who know this story, what happens next? Well, fast forward a little bit. And what we see is God himself makes them a covering from animal skins. Now, to me, this begs the question, where did the animal skins come from? Perhaps it's speculation, but I think that an animal was killed by God in order to make a covering for Adam and Eve's shame. In other words, their sin was covered by sacrifice, by the shedding of blood. Now, of course, in this account, the case is not that their sin was forgiven, but rather it was simply that uh, a covering was brought for them uh, so that their shame was, was something which could be covered as they were expelled from the Garden of Eden. Another insight from the book of Genesis, uh, that God was going to put things right one day by the sacrifice, not of an animal, but this time of a man, is that the serpent representative of Satan, which deceived Eve and was cursed by God for his deception, that he would be defeated. And this was the curse in Genesis 3.14. It says, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Now that last part of the curse, he will crush your head and you will strike his heel, is held by many to be a prophetic foreshadowing of Jesus' death. The enmity that would exist between Satan and the offspring of the woman who would ultimately be Jesus as seen in the genealogies, the son of God, the son of man, the last Adam, where the first Adam failed in sin, the last would triumph in sinlessness. Where the first was defeated by death, the last would defeat death. First Corinthians says, for as by a man came death, by a man also has come the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all shall be made alive. Now we also see in Genesis two brothers, Cain and Abel. One brings an offering to God, which has been gained by the works of his hands. He brings crops, produce, which he has sweated and toiled to grow and harvested. The other Abel brings a lamb a symbol we see in the Bible of sinless perfection, created and sustained by God and then taken by Abel, sacrificed, having its blood shed. Cain's offering is rejected. Abel's is accepted. And the difference? The shedding of blood. I think another difference is that Cain's offering was the work of his own hands and Abel's offering was the work of God. Sure, Abel was a shepherd. He looked after the lambs. But how did the lambs come to be? Through the creation of the creator who brings these things about whether man is involved or not. 
And so that lamb comes provided by God and is slain, having its blood shed, and that sacrifice is acceptable. Without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission of sins. We could think about the example of Abraham, who when faced with the prospect of sacrificing his own son, a foreshadowing of Jesus to come, he ultimately sees God provide a ram for the sacrifice. In all three of these examples, the acceptable object of sacrifice is one which God himself has provided. And then through the death of the provision of God, by the shedding of blood, an atonement is made. And that is what we see in Christ, provided by God from before the foundation of the world, the Bible tells us, and sacrificed for you and for me. The whole story of the Old Testament follows this pattern of sacrifice in order to cover sin. But as Hebrews 10 puts it so well, these animal sacrifices are not sufficient to fully and finally deal with sin once and for all, but the sacrifice of Jesus is. And again, to touch on something I mentioned earlier, one of the reasons for this, just one, I think, is that the animal is a created thing. It is finite in its capacity. It doesn't have a divine nature. But Jesus is the eternal, ever-existing Son of God who is unlimited in his nature and therefore his sacrifice must also be unlimited in its capacity to destroy our sin. So point number four, we'll get two more after this. It says, it tells us in the Bible that this idea of Jesus going to the cross and dying for you and me was pleasing to God. It was pleasing that Jesus should become a man, live a perfect life, which was God honoring and fulfilled the entire law and the prophets, showing us that it's only God who has the ability to live perfectly in accordance with his own law, to reach that standard which he himself has set by his divine nature. In addition to this, it was pleasing to God that Jesus should retain his nature, his divine nature as the Son of God, even whilst inhabiting a human body. Fully God and fully man. It's a mystery. It's something that we cannot fully understand. But this is the teaching of the New Testament, that Jesus Christ was not a mere man, that he was the divine Son of God in flesh. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5. We've touched on Hebrews 10 so many times. It's such a fantastic chapter of Scripture. It says this, but a body you prepared for me. It's a mystery, but it happened. And the question is, do you and I believe this message? 1 Timothy 3.16 says, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness that God was manifest in the flesh. And that body on our behalf would experience the most agonizing death imaginable. And then on top of the physical suffering that he would undergo, the wrath of God against sin would be poured out upon Christ in his own body, on the tree, and in so doing, by taking the wrath of God against sin, he has made a way by which you and I, by trusting in him, can return to God. Colossians 1.19 says, For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile himself all things to himself, all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed upon the cross. I love the Lord Jesus Christ. I love him. I love him. I haven't seen him. Yet I love him because he first loved me. And I believe from the bottom of my heart that this message is true that Jesus Christ, through his death upon the cross, has reconciled me back to God. And that now I live in the liberty of sins forgiven. Debt paid. Shame covered because of Christ. Peace with God now and forever. Will I continue to fail and to sin? Yes, must I live each and every day before the Lord, walking with him, asking him to forgive me for the things I do daily that offend him? Yes, but ultimately, because I have faith in what Christ has done 
on my behalf, I can be sure that I'm saved and that I'm in the family of God and that I'm due to arrive in heaven on that moment when my life is over. Isaiah chapter 53, such an awful but incredible chapter of scripture, says this in verses three to six. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace and with his wounds we are healed. Hallelujah! All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way, turned back to Jesus. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief for us when you shall make his soul an offering for sin. And so it was an offering for my sin and for yours, which pleased the Lord God Almighty. Whether we understand this or not, we will one day understand why it pleased the Lord. But I know this, that it pleases me that Jesus went to the cross and died there. Even although I know how much he suffered there for me, according to what the scriptures tell us, there are some that we cannot enter into, like those hours of suffering that he endured where he bore the weight of sin. But we know what we have in the scriptures. And it pleases me that Jesus died on my behalf because it means that I do not have to pay for my sin myself by being separated from God eternally in hell. And for that, I am forever grateful. Point number five, it happened because it was planned from before the world was created. It's amazing. The, the most incorrect understanding of Jesus' death upon the cross is that somehow it was an accident. That it was something that God did in response to sin having caught him off guard that he didn't see how bad the world would get and that just before it was too late, he decided to intervene by sending Jesus. But the Bible takes a very different perspective that God actually intended Jesus to come before the world was made. 1 Peter 1, 19, 21 says this, you are not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen from before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him, you believe in God who raised him from the dead and glorified him. And so your faith and hope are in God, not in anyone else, not in anything else, not in yourself. Your faith and your hope are in God. And it's amazing that he loves us so much that he would pour out mercy and withhold from us what our sins deserve. Death, the wages of sin is death. Eternal death, spiritual death, death everlasting because we have sinned against a holy God who's absolutely perfect. But he poured out for us upon the cross his grace, giving to us that which we, we don't deserve it, that which we do not deserve. What is grace? It's God's riches at Christ's expense. He paid our sin debt. John chapter 18 verse 4 hints at this idea that it was known that this would happen. Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward, this is in the garden of Gethsemane, and said to them, whom do you seek? Knowing all that would happen to him, Elsewhere in scripture, I believe it says that he set his face as a flint towards Jerusalem. He knew what awaited him there, but he chose to go. John chapter 3 is a precious chapter in verse 16. Many times, though, we don't read the verses preceding and following. And uh, we see there... Um, 
a fulfillment of prophecy from the time of Moses. And it says there in verse 14, that as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, that brazen serpent upon the pole, that people could look to and live by their faith, that looking would save them. Even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believes on him is not condemned, but he that believes not is condemned already because he's not believed on the name of the only begotten Son of God. So it happened because it was planned and it came to fruition just as God intended that the law, the prophets, the Psalms, Isaiah 53 would all be fulfilled. I was reading Psalm 22 recently and we looked at this in the Men for God Bible study and we were just blown away by the details of Christ upon the cross in this Psalm that was written so long before he came. It was planned. It was no accident. It was no mistake. And here we are on our final point, point number six. It happened. Why did it happen? Why did Jesus have to go to the cross for you and I? Well, it happened because God determined that in this way he would be most glorified. The fact that Jesus did this for us to redeem us to God brings great glory and pleasure to God that he is able to initiate a mission to save us that only he can fulfill. And if you think about it, he is the one that does all the work for us by rescuing us, by bringing thousands upon thousands of souls in this world out of death and into life. It's a display of his marvelous grace, giving us what we don't deserve and ensuring that we have nothing to boast about. For it is by grace that we are saved through faith and that not of ourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. We have been saved by the Lord Jesus and his death and his saving power are glorifying to God. Jesus understood that the glory of God was prime in its importance in his death upon the cross. When he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, hours before his arrest, he prayed, John 17, 1 to 5, Father, the hour has come. He knew it was there. Glorify your son, that your son may glorify you, for you have granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they might know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have brought glory on the earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory that I had with thee before the world began. God was glorified through the death of the Lord Jesus upon the cross. It was planned from before the foundation of the world. It seems a bit crazy in some sense to the simple mind like myself that everything that's ever happened in human history would be foreknown by God and permitted, would be allowed. And that History, having played out exactly as it has and exactly as it will, was the setting in which God would be most glorified. We can't get our heads around that, can we? How is it that all of the suffering, all of the death, all of the pain, all of the apparent injustice of this world, I say apparent because ultimately all justice will be done because there is one to whom you and I must give an account and the books will be opened on that day when we stand before God and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ 
is the Son of God. To the glory of God the Father and every knee will bow before him. And if we're not ready for that now, then when we find ourselves standing before God, there will be no option but for us to bow and confess Christ as Lord. And that will be better if we've rejected him in this life. That will be better indeed for those who hate his glorious name, who look at the suffering of the world and that is the reason that they don't trust him when we know that he has endured suffering that is incomparable to anything that any man has ever suffered because he has borne our sins in his own body upon the tree. So just to conclude uh, our second part of the thoughts that I've brought to you on the crucifixion of Jesus and why it happened. Philippians 2 verse 6 to 11 says this, Jesus Verse 6 begins, who, existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, to be held on to, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant. This is God taking the form of a servant, being made in the likeness of man and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even the death of a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him to the highest place and given him the name above all names that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. There's a hymn that says this, and this is the final thought I'd like to leave with you if you're watching this, that we've thought of many things. Uh, can't remember them all off the top of my head, but we've thought of many things, many reasons why Jesus had to die upon the cross. We've touched on the seriousness of sin. We've touched on the fact that God is holy and he must punish sin and that there's a solution for our sin problem, that Jesus Christ came, a demonstration of the love of God, the grace of God, the mercy of God, the compassion of God, the heart of God to reach out and save us who don't deserve it because we have rebelled against him. But he has made a way by which we, placing our faith and trust in him, taking our eyes from off of ourselves and our works righteousness and our actions in this world that we think are good enough and switching our focus by repentance to faith in Christ, that through that action, his blood, his work is applied to us and we can be set free for eternity and enjoy eternal life with him. What a hope, what a privilege, what, what, what amazing grace that you and I can experience in our lives here and now through simple faith in Christ. Now, of course, people will say there's more to it than this. There's more. You can't, it can't just be as simple as believing. And we think of things like repentance, that, that we make a choice to turn away from our sin, something that we can't do without the help of God and without God's work in our hearts by his spirit. Of course, there are many moving parts, but fundamentally, without faith, it's impossible to please God. If we don't believe that Jesus is the Christ, if we don't believe that he went to the cross for us, then nothing's going to happen in our lives. Repentance becomes irrelevant if we don't fundamentally have faith in Christ and believe that he was sacrificed for us. And so we've thought about the fact that his sacrifice was necessary, the shedding of his blood was absolutely essential. And we've thought about the fact that dying upon the cross there was for you and was for me, that it was pleasing to God and it was glorifying to God there. I think I've remembered all of the points. And so I'll conclude with the words of a beautiful hymn, my faith has found a resting place, not in device or creed. I trust the ever-living one, his wounds for me shall plead. I need no other 
argument. I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. Enough for me that Jesus saves. This ends my fear and doubt. A sinful soul I come to him. He will never cast me out. My heart is leaning on the word, the living word of God. Salvation by my Savior's name. Salvation through his blood. My great physician heals the sick, the lost he came to save. For me, his precious blood he shed. For me, his life he gave. It's amazing. It's amazing grace. And it's something that you and I have uh, to look forward to, to meet that one who gave his life for us. I love the, the first uh, verse of this. My faith has found a resting place, not in device or creed. It's nothing to do with man. I trust the ever-living one. His wounds for me 